good afternoon. Um, then I'm going to do the presentation um, with the title from digitization to digital repatriation and uh, analyze the case study international Dun Huang project. So my presentation will contain five parts. First of all, I will introdu introduce two specific contexts uh, or concepts, uh, repatriation and digital repatriation, and then my research aims and research questions. And uh, I think it's necessary for me to um, introduce the specific context of China and uh, the historical background of Dunhuang materials, which the International Dunhuang Project refers to, to you to give you a general idea of this project. And the rest of uh, the presentation will be the case study, um, which I will interpret the International Dunhuang Project as an ethical approach to address the issue of repatriation in the context of China um, and how it works in China. So now we're coming to the concept, repatriation and digital repatriation. Well, repatriation refers to the lost cultural properties uh, which left their community or country of origin. Well, war plundered, uh, illicit trafficking, theft, and uh, illegal excavation. And in digital repatriation here mean, uh, concerns the delivery in appropriate formats of copies of images, recordings, notes, observations, and other records of the culture of the people. But I'm not going to discuss the digital, digitized process of the International Dunhuang Project and uh, the specific technologies in IDP. But I'm going to study the international collaboration in this project and the specific relationship it constructed between China and other participants in the project. So as you may know, uh, China is the country who faced a large amount of cultural properties that leave this country and are now collected in museums and libraries in the world. And uh, while the repatriation in China actually is slightly different with the repatriation of indigenous people, because it's kind of a uh, state-to-state -state repatriation. And um, so my research aim is to analyze um, International Dunhuang Project as an ethical approach uh, in the context of China to undertake the physical or uh, the digital repatriation and to explore the potentiality and insufficiencies of digital repatriation. So, and I got my research question, in the context of China, to what extent does international digitization project like IDP ethically engaged in and impact digital repatriation. Well, we're going to, um, I'm going to introduce the specific context of China and the historical background of Dunhuang materials. International Dunhuang Project actually um, is the international cooperative project uh, which organized by the British Library since 1993. Um, and uh, it mainly focused on the Asian Dunhuang materials which was funded in the library cave in Dunhuang Grottoes um, in the northwest of China. And this Dunhuang materials was unfairly sold by this Taoist monk Wang Yuanlu. Uh, to the Western and Japanese expeditions in the, night, in the early 20th century and then dispersed from Dunhuang to the museums and libraries in the world. But Dunhuang Grutos actually plays an important role in uh, the history of Asian China. It is on the way of the Asian Silk Road and it is the gate for Asian China to do the cultural and uh, commercial ex exchange and communication at that time. So this is the, it, this is the famous Buddhism site and this is the place to, for um, Asian people to do their religious belief, to uh, do their religious behaviors. And uh, it was listed by the, UNESCO, by the UNESCO to the World Cultural Heritage List in 1987. And actually, this is an old picture of number 16 cave, and we are, going to dis we are going to say the number 17 cave. Number 17 cave is, have, have a mysterious story. 
uh, this, this, store, this small door at the north wall of the number 16 cave is actually the number 17 cave, yes, uh, is the library cave. And in this cave, it was sealed for a thousand years and it contains a large bunch of uh, ancient Dunhuang materials, manus including manuscripts, paintings, um, and relics. And if nowadays you went to Dunhuang, you go to Dunhuang grottoes, you will see um, the number 17 cave is like this. And uh, how does, how did this ancient Dunhuang materials dispersed to the world. Well, the, there's a famous archaeology that we have to mention here. The photo at the upper left corner is the most famous um, hungry British arch archaeologist, um, Sir Stain. He primarily known for his exploration and the archaeological discoveries in the Central Asia. And um, he played an essential role I mean, discovering this hidden Dunhuang materials in the library cave as well um, since 1907. And uh, well, actually, I understand his efforts and the works, but his works actually a little bit controversial in China. Um, and he acquired 24 cases of Asian materials, um, and including manuscripts and four cases of paintings and relics by unfairly transaction with that Taoist monk. I think the total value at that, at that time is around 90 pounds, so it's very cheap. And uh, his discovery even inspired a lot of um, Japanese, uh, Russian, American, and even Chinese treasure hunters and explorers. So the photo at the lower left shows the original look of this Asian Dunhuang materials. Actually, in this small um, sealed library cave, they are full of bunches of this Asian manuscripts, as you can see in the right photo. This is also another famous archaeologist from France uh, named Paul Pelliot. And this photo shows um, he examined the Asian manuscripts uh, in the library cave at that time. And he, he went to Dunhuang in just one year after Mr. Stain in 1908. And all this um, Dunhuang materials refers to, uh, contains um, the scrolls, manuscripts that uh, describe the local life and local culture, and also contains the religion's um, content, which could help to study Dunhuang culture deeper and more vividly, of course. So which I want to say that digitization of this Asian Dunhuang manuscript is actually very important. So under this historical um, background, to establish an online uh, international database of this Dunhuang materials and make them freely online, freely available online in a variety of languages, British Library started to cooperate with um, uh, seven major institutions in the world to work on the digitization of this Dunhuang materials. Um, China have two branches, the National Library of China and the Dunhuang Academy in Dunhuang. And this is the official website of uh, IDP project. It was opened in 1998 and um, this database is open to the, to the public from the uh, school children to the scholars without any charges as long as it's used for research education only. And the advantage of this IDP project, I have to say, first of all, it's easy for researchers to access and reduce expenses. In the early um, 20th century, scholars who studied the Dunhuang culture had to go abroad and uh, visit museums and libraries in the world, which cost them a lot of money, and also hard for them to get the permission as well. And the second one, uh, second advantage is the, it help to unify the retrieval standards and the catalogs. Well, actually, in, even in China, a lot of museums and libraries themselves establish their own database and establish their own standards, which makes scholars, even in China, hard to 
search, but uh, in this website at the left, it, they, they provide a great searching engine that you can search with the code, the catalog, and the bibliography. And the third advantage of IDP is it can benefit related researches. For example, the whole Asian uh, Dunhuang manuscript actually was divided into a lot of pieces uh, accidentally uh, in the past and stored in different museums. And for scholars, it's really hard for them to get all these original pieces and mix them together. So with the digital images, it largely helped the scholars to combine these pieces in different museums in the world and then facilitate the research of um, the agriculture, the economics, or even the costume at that time. And the last advantage is this, um, as the director of IDP said in her paper, it, this website value user's experience very much. And the reviews and comments of this uh, website actually helped to develop the project itself. So this IDP project actually provided a new idea of sharing digital data uh, with international partners to China, and then proposed the concept of digital repatriation to China. And we have already discussed a lot of advantages, but According to my field work in China, there's still a lot of worries and uh, disputes exist. I summarized two main questions. The first one is the digital manuscripts is not real manuscripts. And the, and the second question is the ownership belongs to whom? Well, to answer the first question, I want to classify the digital object and the real object. Well, it is not to propose that a digital object can or ought to replace the physical object, but simply that the two do different things and therefore complement each other. So I do acknowledge the cultural significance and the value of the real object, of course, but digital object also have its own cultural and educational significance and in specific contexts. And it is the reproduction of the real project. And to answer the second question about the ownership, as the organizer, the IDP and the British Library actually provide us a great example. The British Library provide uh, te technology support and the separate internet servers to the IDP local branches and images was scanned, uploaded by the local branches themselves and no, uh, cannot be modified by the other participants, which largely reduced the worries uh, from Chinese scholars. And the ownership of these digital copies belong to the IDP local branches themselves. And it also, it also helped to bond it all the international participants and reduce their worries. So to summary, for the short term advantages, such international digitization project is much easier to achieve than physical repatriation and have much more potentiality to inspire more digital repatriation cases in China. And for the long term benefits, IDP actually helped constructing a compromise win-win relationship and then moved the issue of physical repatriation forward. And I mentioned the concept here, a compromised win-win relationship. I acknowledge that digital repatriation is sort of compromise approach in order to gain win-win for uh, in current situation in the context of China. And compromise has been already um, started in politics, re uh, international relations, and uh, business. But when you think about compromise, you probably will think um, it is just tolerance and escape or surrender or cowardice. But for me, I think being sensible compromise is worth to study. And what win-win means, 
Because in this world, giving and receiving are not just really monodirectional or line and have to be thought of as re reciprocal and uh, cyclical ongoing processes. And win-win here means each participant gains something rather than nothing. And it refers to a dynamic debt balance of loss and gain among each party through international cooperation and the communication. And this balance actually constantly changes and progresses uh, to, uh, through these discourses and the negotiations, which means it's quite a fragile relationship it could be impacted by the fragile uh, international relations or even the government attitude. And to maintain this balance, members should keep tight communication and collaboration and then reach the acceptable, acceptable result and the reciprocity on the basis of equality. So in short, there are four key words that could help building the win-win relationship which is equal, balance, negotiation, and reciprocity. Well, equal is the basis of this compromise win-win situation. Every member should be put into this equal situation in the power structure so that members' voice can be listened fairly and loudly and other members can think their voice carefully. Well, balance actually is the characteristics of this compromise win-win relationship and it requires the mutual adjustment of interest. Well, actually, the idea of balance came from the, one of the most important Asian um, ethical branches in China from the Confucianism. In Chinese, it's he, which means harmony in English. Well, harmony means we act things. Our behavior should not go strict extremely. We should stand in the middle and stand in the neutral position and do everything balanced. Well, negotiation here actually is the approach to get this balance. And win-win should be a long-lasting and ongoing situation that requires common efforts and get mutual development. Well, during more and more negotiation, actually Chinese scholars tend to self-reflection their past and they have to reconsider their past wrongs because Chinese scholars uh, tend to re realize that <coughs> the Chinese government actually did something wrong in the past. And this self-reflectivity actually could bring more opportunities for Chinese and other participants to build mutual trust and respect for further collaboration. Well, then the last is the result of this compromise win-win is the reciprocity. So it is optimistic that some, uh, some Chinese scholars nowadays begin to accept and understand the advantages of IDP. And although problems still exist for further discussion, but learning from international Dunhuang project it is a realistic but potential model for digital repatriation. It changes our mind of repatriation from simple digitization to the digital repatriation and from mutual hatred to mutual trust and respect and understanding and from isolation to collaboration. So indeed, from my perspective, I think digital repatriation is not the alternative of physical repatriation by the very beginning of it. And IDP provides a win-win mode from digitization to digital repatriation, which could help to move the issue of repatriation forward in the context of China. Thank you.